Good evening, everyone. My name is Adam Van Susteren. I am the chapter president of the San Diego Federalist Society. And we have a great panel this evening. Uh, we also have Papa John's Pizza that is apparently 15 minutes late. So after the panel, you guys will feel free to have some pizza and stick around and ask these guys some questions off the record. Um, the Federal Society, we've had several very important debates regarding Proposition 8, ethics in contracting with attorneys general. We've had Justice Scalia come out and speak to us, Attorney General Meese, Clifford Wallace of the Ninth Circuit. We've been lucky enough to have Judge Orfield moderate a panel, and he is excellent. He is a retired judge, a mediator, and if he can settle this pension issue, I don't think... <laughs> I don't think anyone else deserves to be on the court appointed mediator list. George Orfield. Thank you. Well, I've checked my wallet and there are no fees on deposit, so I cannot mediate any issue at the present time. I do want to uh, thank the San Francisco Giants for taking care of business before the seventh and final deciding game, which would have been tonight. <laughs> I woke up in a cold sweat over the weekend thinking that the four of us would be sitting around in this cavernous room talking to each other if that occurred. But thank you. It's good. I'm glad you're here. It's uh, good to um, be talking about one of the most interesting issues I think to be presented uh, in a public forum in a long time. The public pension crisis. The word pension. The word, the phrase city pensions. You cannot talk about too many issues in public life and not soon get around somehow talking about the pension issues, the pension problems, the challenges that we face uh, in the public safety sector, the challenges we face with public services, the challenges we face with employees, employer issues, with tenure, with longevity, with filling positions, we libraries, parks, you just name it. Start talking about anything with the word public in it and within five minutes you're going to be talking about the pension issue. So thank you for coming. This is going to be a very engaging evening, a very engaging hour uh, or more. And I encourage you and one reason why these forums work so well that the Federalist Society puts on is they want and they expect audience engagement. And I encourage you to turn this into something far more than just three talking heads. I encourage you to be a part of this discussion. Each one of these individuals has fielded a question or two in their lives. They're very comfortable doing so. They're three very engaging individuals and they would welcome any participation that this audience cares to engage in. It's part of the process, ladies and gentlemen, I encourage you to do so. We have quite a panel. I indicated to them that I was going to introduce them in alphabetical order and Michael Zuckett cried foul immediately. <laughs> He said, welcome to my life. I said, fine. Ladies and gentlemen, on this panel we have, and let me start with Michael Zuckett. Now he and I have two very interesting things in common. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of California at Santa Barbara in Business Economics and Environmental Studies, and my oldest daughter is a freshman at UCSB. Mr. Zuckett obtained a master's degree from Duke University in environmental economics and policy, and I received no degree from Duke University. <laughs> but I did go there for one year of graduate studies in microbiology and immunology, and I discovered just how smart those people at Duke really are, and I got the heck out of Dodge and went to law school. So. Those are two things that we share. Um, we both obviously bleed gaucho and blue devil blood. But there are similarities end. <laughs> Mr. Zuckett uh, worked for the United States Department of Energy, renewable energy economist, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, 
He was the governmental affairs director for the San Diego City Firefighters Local 145. And in 2002, he was elected to the San Diego City Council. And in 2005, served as its deputy mayor. Perhaps most importantly, though, to our discussion tonight is his current position as general manager of the San Diego Municipal Employees Association. 4,000 city employees are a member of this group. They cross 400 job classifications, different job classifications. They are the largest labor union representing city of San Diego employees. So Mr. Zuckett comes here with a thing or two to say about the pension issue. Jan Goldsmith, I used to count him as a colleague, but the San Diego City Attorney's Office took him away from us. And he comes here tonight as the San Diego City Attorney. Uh, that is only one of his many accomplishments. He was the mayor of Poway. He was a member of the State Assembly and quite a mover and shaker when he was up in Sacramento. He was the majority floor leader. He was chair of the Banking and Finance Committee. And he was vice chair of the Judiciary Committee, which kind of was a portend of the future because in 1998, uh, he was a, fortunately for us, sitting on the bench, uh, was appointed to the San Diego Superior Court and was there until 2008, at which time he was taken away by the city attorney's position. I asked him why, he said, because it was a challenge. And he certainly is up to that challenge and uh, good to have him here tonight and to see him again. The Honorable Carl DeMaio, currently a council member for the city of San Diego representing District 5. He was all over the paper today <laughs> in the union. I had so much fun reading the front page and the article that went on to A8 about Proposition D to read about a member of my panel. I was very proud to see his name all over that article. He was said, described as the leader of the opposition to Proposition D. Uh, he feels that was not the right way to meet some of the issues uh, that we have, including the pension issue. Very interesting, the paper said that tomorrow he is going to issue a five-year plan to solve the city's budget crisis. And one of the two prongs, so said the article, as if it knew, one of the prongs of this plan involves employee pensions. Now perhaps we can wrestle a few particulars out of the good councilman today uh, before the Friday introduction of this plan. But uh, even before he got to the council, uh, he was known as the, quote, City Hall Watchdog, close quote. I'm sure he's very proud of that title. Uh, that's probably a title that's followed him on to the, uh, the uh, council, uh, to say the, uh, say the least. He also, I found this very interesting, he also founded two fascinating um, uh, organizations. One was uh, the Performance Institute, which was a private think tank uh, dedicated to the reformation of government. And also he uh, was a founder of the American Strategic Management Institute. So ladies and gentlemen, we have no shortage of expertise on this panel this afternoon and this evening. And it is a pleasure to moderate this group. Uh, I am going to sit back and enjoy some of this as much as you will. I'm going to ask now, in the order in which they were introduced, uh, for the individuals to give you a brief overview of what they see, what the issues are, what the overview is, when they talk about the city pension issue, when they talk about the public pension crisis. So, Mr. Zuckett, if you'll start us off. Okay. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Um, Nice to be with a few judges tonight. I like judges. Uh, 
some of my favorite people in the world, uh, one in particular. But um, uh, let me just launch right in with uh, with a few points. We'll, there will be plenty of time for um, uh, debate and actual argument, not in the sense of fisticuffs, but in the sense of spin. But I want to start with a few facts <coughs> that I don't think anybody else on the panel will dispute that might just help sort of set the stage uh, from employees' perspective in the city of San Diego. And the first is that despite all the rhetoric, despite all of the uh, attention on some pensions in the city of San Diego, the people that we represent, and we represent general employees, um, 911 dispatchers, water department employees, um, people who staff your branch libraries and your parks and recreation center. They make up to about two-thirds of, 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 of city workers. Their average salary is about $53,000 a year and their average pension after working for the city for 25 plus years is $31,000 a year. <clears throat> they don't have Social Security because the city entice them to vote themselves out of the Social Security program 30 years ago. So we can uh, debate tonight or some other time whether those are appropriate levels of compensation for city employees, but I wanted to make clear that that is the compensation for the typical city employee in those classification. And again, that represents about two-thirds of the city. So it's not your fault if you think every employee makes a million dollars a year and has a five million dollar a year retirement. But the reality is they make $53,000 a year and make on average after two and a half decades with the city a $31,000 annual pension. Now the second fact is that by any metric, whether it's firefighters per, uh, per square, fire stations per square mile, police officers per thousand residents, uh, park and recreation workers per acre of parkland, libraries per resident. San Diego has the leanest city government of any government in the state of California. We do more with less than any comparable jurisdiction, not only in California, but across the nation. And um, so this notion that there's a lot of you know low-hanging fat fruit uh, around um, is just not true. And the third uh, sort of factual thing that hopefully we can agree on is that with respect to revenue in the city of San Diego, taxes, our tax structure, if you were to take the average tax structure of the 10 largest cities in the state of California for hotel tax, sales tax, trash tax, uh, business license fees, you name it. Take all those taxes that the average California city has and take that tax structure and apply it to the city of San Diego. The city of San Diego would have an additional $300 million a year in revenue. So what that tells us is that in terms of the level of which San Diegans pay for their services, it's very low compared to other cities. So I'm not here to argue for higher taxes. Uh, from what I hear, we lost that on one on Tuesday, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, just by by uh, by a little. But um, but the point is, we get by with a lot less than any other jurisdiction does in California and many other cities. And so that leads us into perhaps the more argumentative part of this, which is how do we do that? How do we provide services for our citizens and do it for so much less? than anybody else. Are we just are we just good? Are we just a, a great city and really smarter than the rest of the country? And the answer is, uh, well, maybe. But um, but you have to go back over the last 30 years as to how we've how we've done this all. And and my friend Jan Goldsmith is absolutely correct when he says it's pointless to go back and point fingers. And I agree with him and that's not the spirit with which I offer some of this some of these comments. But I do think it's important to to uh, to figure out how did we get here. And the way we got here was not because of a bunch of uh, liberal, wacko, democratic city councils bestowing huge um, benefits with no strings attached on labor unions which of course control the city. No, uh, although that's the popular perception. This goes all the way back to 1980 and Mayor Pete Wilson and a Republican city council uh, who first confronted the what is now the commonplace, ever-present budget deficit in San Diego. And God forbid we go to the citizens and tell them the truth that actually our tax revenue doesn't match our desires and our, and our needs. No, uh, we can't tell them that, and we still want to do all the things we want to do, so how are we going to get around it? Well, how about that pension system? How about we offer employees increased benefits and save the money in this year's budget 
and will push off that obligation down a few decades. And that wasn't, uh, you know, Tony Atkins or Mike Zuckett's idea. That was Pete Wilson's idea. And in 1980, he started doing that. And in 1982, he said, city employees, we're paying, we as a city, whatever it was at the time, uh, for 7 or 8% for Medicare and Social Security. And we'd like to save that cost. But we understand you, the employees, have to vote yourselves out of Social Security for us to be able to save that cost. So to entice you to do it, we're going to give you a supplemental pension plan. We're going to pay, we're going to match 3% of your salary. And to take care of Medicare, we're going to promise you lifetime city-paid retiree health. And everybody said, what a great idea. And Mayor Wilson got to do his priorities that year, and the, ki the can had been kicked down the road. And what did he do with the savings from the payroll savings? Did he pre-fund the retiree health benefit, which was an obligation that he had promised? No, he didn't need to deal with that. The next, the next mayor, the next council can deal with that. We're going to fund big buildings and redevelopment and political conventions and ballparks and convention centers and stadiums and all the and public safety and all the services we all want. And that is just an anecdote among many um, stories and truths about how we got here. At every turn, mayors and city council members for the last 30 years, usually Republican dominated councils and mayors, instead of facing the honest truth about budget and either raising revenue or cutting services, said, no, 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 we can do it all. Don't worry. And how are they doing it all? By doing things off of the general fund, through the pension system. When employees asked for a raise, I said, we're not going to give you a raise, but we're going to give you a little spiff over here on the retirement system. And those things build and build and build. Mayor Wilson also came up with the notion of surplus undistributed earnings in the pension system. So in other words, when the pension system had a good year, he'd say, let's spend a little bit of that. It's surplus. Well, we all know now the folly of that. It's not surplus. It's, it's to be saved for the years when the investment returns are bad. But this notion of the 13th check and these other side uh, retirement uh, benefits, those were created back in the Pete Wilson days. And so here we are now, 30 years later. It's hit the fan. The bill has come due. And whose fault is it? It's the public employees. What are the only fixes that we hear coming out of City Hall? Let's take it from the city employees. It's their fault. Um, I would uh, gently remind my friend Carl DeMaio that all of this was in place back in 2002 when, as the judge said, Carl was a very effective watchdog. Back then, he was giving awards to the city of San Diego, as was uh, governmental uh, watchdog agencies across the country, as to that we were a model of fiscal responsibility. Uh, everything that we talk about that is problematic today was in place and had been in place for decades in 2002, but it had been, either been hidden or had been plainly clear, but nobody seemed to care. For instance, the legislative retirement program, which which Mr. DeMaio has, has, has used and had a lot of fun with. That was in place well before 2000, but somehow the city was a model of fiscal responsibility back then. But now when the bill has come due, everything is, everything is sideways. So I, I, I offer that up as sort of a perspective, and forgive me if it sounds defensive, but this notion that it's the Democrats, the liberal unions running the city, and of course those horrible, greedy city employees who have caused all the problems, that's not the truth. That may not help us with a solution, and we can talk more about that tonight, but I wanted to sort of set that stage uh, just for kicks with my uh, few minutes. So thank you very much. You're welcome. I certainly um, appreciate the lack of any finger pointing, and I'm sure Republican Pete Wilson appreciates that there was no finger pointing whatsoever in that oratory. Where were the facts? <laughs> you promised me facts. The facts, ma'am, at the facts. And Mr. Zuket is up to the task. He'll, he'll, he'll defend this as we go through the evening. Uh, let me turn uh, to a perspective from our city attorney, Jan Goldsmith. Thank you, Judge Orfield. I don't know about you, but I miss the bench a lot. I wish I could just order changes and get my bailiff to keep people quiet if they don't like it. Can't do things that way. Um, let me just um, make uh, several points. Um, three points, and I'm going to have a discussion about them. First of all, we do have a serious 
fiscal problem when we do have a serious pension and retiree health problem. We have to face up to it. The second is, when we face in up to these problems, we have to have a serious discussion. We can't have the silly discussion anymore. The pointing of the fingers. The talks about the magic potions, and I'll get to that in a minute. The third thing is, that make no mistake about it, solving these problems is going to require tough medicine. And it's going to affect us all. And no, we can't just take it all from our employees. Otherwise, good employees are going to leave. And we don't want to see that happen. We are going to have to make change the way we do business. Let me talk about first our problem. And I'm going to just touch on this a bit um, because I know that Councilman DeMaio likes to talk about this and more facts and figures than I, than I have. Um, but the fact of the matter is today we face a $2.1 billion unfunded liability in our uh, pension plan. Um, the annual payment this year was $225 million. If it hadn't have been for the investment losses and what was called MP1, MP2, those deals that were cut back in 1996 and 2002, uh, the payment would have been much, much less in the range of $70 million as I understand the breakdown. Um, retiree health, uh, we do have a program for retiree health, uh, not for new employees, that's been cut off, but we have um, uh, for, for existing employees and retirees, and if it continues the way it is, we have a $1.3 billion unfunded liability, we're not even paying that off. Um, it's a pretty, it's a challenge, the escalate, the, the balloon, uh, the $225 million for this year on our pension obligation. Uh, if it could just stay constant, it may not be that bad. The problem is that it escalates every year for the next 15 years or so until I think it was around 2035, it maxes out at $511 million. Now this may change um, if investment gains this year, and I'm looking at some people from SD SERS and maybe they can tell us how much we've gained, but it's not, I understand because we've had, we've had some deep losses like everyone else, uh, it's going to have a, a huge impact. Uh, even without, even with these gains. But every year we have a bigger balloon until it peaks at around half a billion dollars. Uh, I've represented corporations in the past uh, that have to ha have faced a balloon payment, one. And we have what's called a workout plan. And sometimes it's in bankruptcy, sometimes it's out. But they work it through. Here we've got 15 years of increasing balloon payments and we've got to deal with it one way or the other. It's either got to be paid off, adjusted, the assumptions have to be adjusted, things have to change. We know that. The second thing is we have to stop this, uh, we do have a problem. The second thing is we have to have a serious discussion and stop with the silly discussions. You know, I read th this article this morning, this opinion, and it's nice to see Zuket and Ruben Borales, my good friend Julie Meyer, write, write articles, but Mike Aguirre is no longer city attorney. Mike Aguirre tried. He no longer has solutions to this problem. Why is it that the media in this town seems to think that he has a legitimate discussion? He is the king of the silly discussions. He wants to go back, he, with all these lawsuits that he has pending, he pointed out they haven't been dismissed yet, true, but he's still saying whether we use the lawsuit or the debt adjustment power of the federal bankruptcy court, the pension debt has to be reduced. Give it a break, We've, we have to try something different. That, didn't, that stuff didn't work, that approach didn't work. He spends most of his uh, time bashing. Uh, the, the city council voted themselves stuff and all these things that happened with the unions and all that. Let me tell you something. He was bashing the city council one time and I said, the current city council, he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, Todd Gloria was 17 years old when MP1 was passed. What do you want him to do about it? Where were you, Mike? Stop the bashing. Let me tell you what the headline read on June 21, 1996. The Union Tribune, quote, city has a deal, but will pension trustees buy it, close quote. And here's what a pension board trustee said to everyone in San Diego in June of 1996. Gee, I'm concerned that a 10-year-old kid today is going to be paying for my retirement when he's 25 years old. It looks like we're on a slippery slope. The pension board's lawyer was more blunt. Quote, you're, trust, you're transferring that huge burden to future taxpayers. Close quote. They fleeced us. 
I wasn't a resident of San Diego in 1996, but now I am, and I'm that future taxpayer. They fleeced us in broad daylight. That's what they did. And most of this community was quiet. Where was the financial editor of the Union Tribune? Where was everybody? If you want to look at scapegoats, let's all look in the mirror and say, we screwed up. Okay? And stop it with the magic potions. Stop it with the bashing and stop it with the magic potions. Magic potions are great in the movies and in political rhetoric. All you've got to do is do this one thing and it all goes away. If you bash people, it'll all go away. L lawsuits. In come the lawyers with the magic potions. Get a kick out of that one. Lawsuits have their place and we have our lawsuits. They help resolve issues. This problem of the pension, retiree health, is going to be resolved when we sit down at the table and have a global resolution to face up to our problem and take some tough medicine. It is lawsuits alone are not going to solve our problems. Then comes the bad, uh, the big one, bankruptcy. Here, Mike gets more, more press about this bankruptcy stuff. I spoke out about it last January. I'll speak out against again. It's dumb. It's stupid. It's a magic potion. You're not going to get rid of your pensions. And what's more, the city will be taken through an incredible amount of cost and acrimony. People wondered why the other night I agreed on television to debate Mike. I got to debate him. We got to end this magic potion talk and get to what we have to do is a tough medicine. I'm not telling you that it's easy, but I'm telling you that it's doable. And there are some elements. You can't just take away vested, legitimate pension benefits. Too many people in this town believe you can just go and the librarian who is making, you know, 25 years in the city and gets his or her pension and that you just go in tomorrow and to take it away if only we had the votes on the city council and give it back to the fire rings and fire rings. That's not the way it works. <coughs> pension benefits are vested under the California Constitution just as pr other property rights are vested. I'm not gonna let the city go in and just violate the law. My former colleagues aren't gonna let that happen. That's magic potion. That's the stuff you see in movies. The tough medicine is, and uh, our labor friends aren't gonna like it, a lot of people in the community aren't gonna like it. If people aren't working for the city anymore, they take with them their pension rights. So when you outsource, you have less employees. You pay the contractor. The contractor decides between his or her employees and the contractor their pension benefits. As for the city, the, the city no longer has employees doing that work. They take their pension benefits with them. When you reduce salaries, pen pension benefits are reduced because it's based upon salaries. When you in increase contributions of, uh, of employees toward the pension, where you legally can, that reduces the obligation of the city. New employees do not have vested, before they become employees, don't have vested pension benefits. There are things you can do. All of them are tough. Outsource, increase contributions, new employees, change the rules, some of which is done, and you can affect salaries and other, other benefits. In addition, there's other ways. Why does it always fall on the employees? Mike Zuckett makes that point. I have an office of 350 people in my, my attorney's office, uh, my city attorney's office. I value these workers. They do good work for the city. We win lawsuits, a lot of them. We prosecute criminals. I don't want to lose good people. The more burden I put on the people in my office, the more I lose good people. I lost some pretty good lawyers to the private sector. Believe it or not, they're hiring. So we have to be careful. And we have to administer this tough medicine carefully. But make no mistake about it. We do have to face up to it. Now the bad news is, is that we have 15 years of escalating balloons. The good news is, is that after it peaks at $500 million, guess what happens to it? We have paid it down a lot. The 
eventually, and was, I think it's around 2040, yeah, Elaine and some of the people from SDSERS could correct me, the unfunded liability that used to be today 2.1 billion is reduced down to about 90 million, if I recall, because we were paying it off. A workout plan can be put together that al allows us to pay something out over a long period of time with a funding source to make sure that it happens. Save the city from financial disaster. But in the meantime, there are some things we can do, that tough medicine. We can cut services. We can cut contributions to outside agencies. This city, as Judge Orfield mentioned, I was mayor of Poway, smaller city. We kept things simple. San Diego doesn't keep things simple. They make things, I think they're in the business of making things complicated. Anybody know what CCDC, SEDC, and our redevelopment agency, what the difference is that they do? I mean, if you could explain it to me, I think I have an idea, but it's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of overlap in the commissions, the committees, the de departments, the divisions. Let's simplify our city. We find out a lot, we squeeze out a lot of stuff that we do. A lot of contributions that the city makes to different organizations. That doesn't require us to cut any employees. A lot of services we provide that we may not want to provide, may not afford to. These are all tough medicine. We're going to need to sit down. We're going to need to have a global resolution. We're going to need to involve labor. Not only because state law requires it, but because we want input. We want partners in these solutions, but we can't avoid them anymore. We can't ignore them. We don't want to follow magic potions. We know we've got to take tough medicine. Let's go do it. All right. Um, moderator talking point number three is bankruptcy an issue. Okay. We'll take that one off the table. We'll find out uh, what the third side of this triangle is by talking to the Honorable Carl DeMaio. By the way, uh, he, um, he made history when he won his seat. He wasn't an incumbent. He won his seat in the primary and he won it by an astounding 66%. I wrote that down and circled it and I forgot to mention it up front. I just want to make sure he gets kudos for that. That's, that's quite extraordinary. But Councilman DeMaio, where all of this is probably going to come right down on you and your colleagues, what is going to happen? What's going on? Well, I decided to win in the primary because I'm a big fan of efficiency. Why have two elections when you can finish it off in one? <laughs> <laughs> Good, good evening. Um, if I fall asleep, it's because uh, last night was my first night of seven hours of sleep in the past probably nine or ten days. Um, as was referenced tomorrow, I am going to be releasing a, a five-year financial recovery plan, and I want to focus tonight on the pension-related reforms in that plan. Um, the thing that we all have to understand is that if we do not reform the pension liability and the annual pension costs, no cut is going to be deep enough to our city services and no tax increase is going to be great enough to save us from insolvency. As soon as you embrace that fact and understand, when you look at the numbers and realize, wait a minute, without restructuring these liabilities, we're dead. Back in August of 2009, I had uh, some bankruptcy experts in my office and I said, I've looked at the numbers. I'm not seeing how we can sustain this. Give me your best shot at bankruptcy. What do we do? How do we do it? What do we get in bankruptcy? They laid out the process. And I agree wholeheartedly with our city attorney. Bankruptcy does not offer us anything of value that we don't already have at our disposal. It would, however, create great legal risk, accounting costs, legal costs, and delay us by several years from making the hard choices. I then brought in pension experts from the private sector. They work under ERISA. I said, look, if we were under ERISA, what would you do to our pension system? Walk me through it. We were documenting all the things that they say you can do to a pension system to bring it into solvency. We then had lawyers come in and they documented, here are the things in the public sector you can do, here are the things in the public sector you can't do, because you're not under ERISA. And based upon some of the you can do and some of the we think you can do, we sat down with the city attorney's office and we have a city attorney who thoughtfully, methodologically, 
and in a focused manner, reviews our legal options, explores them. He has been very thoughtful in how he has filed lawsuits to focus in on specific questions and test specific reforms. And guess what? He's won them. And with every victory, he's given myself as a city council member, the city council as a whole, and our mayor, and more importantly, taxpayers, options. Those options do not contain a silver bullet. However, if you pursue all the options in concert, you have a solution. So when I looked at Prop D and they said, well, we have a 401k plan that we're establishing. And Carl, you brought that idea to San Diego. You and John Morlock up in Orange County, you've been pushing that 401k opt-out program. Okay, great. But if you don't fit it in as part of a comprehensive matrix of reforms all attacking the issue all at once, it won't really produce that much savings. Frankly, without additional levers, incentives, you won't get city employees to voluntarily opt out of a tier that is high into a more affordable tier. And so for the past seven months, we've gone through a process of reverse engineering our city's budget. Like in a bankruptcy proceeding, and there are elements I love about bankruptcy. One of the elements I love about it is that a judge won't let you leave bankruptcy unless you can show that you can actually make a profit after reorganization. Otherwise, he'll say, you're in the wrong courtroom, you're in the wrong bankruptcy process, you need to liquidate. So the first thing we have to do is determine, can our city government provide our version of profit, which is quality neighborhood services? If the answer is no, then we should go line up in front of bankruptcy because it's no worse than we're, we're going to experience. A second test. In bankruptcy, the judge will require that you develop a solution and a spending plan and commit to hitting those targets. You have to file your plan. It's detailed. All liabilities are on the table. The effect of changes have to be fully scored and people have to sign off on it. You have to have the legal ability to do it. So what, another thing that the bankruptcy process offers uh, that's attractive is the idea that you have to spell it out, score it, document it, and have certain targets that you have to hit. And the third thing I love about bankruptcy is that you have this unelected judge who puts his thumb on the parties and is the accountability mechanism. We can recreate those forces in San Diego. We can examine and put together a financial recovery plan that has clear targets. And the, the particular target that I'm interested in is a cap on labor costs. And even more so than the cap on labor costs is a commitment over five years to cap and if possible reduce pensionable pay. I want you guys to write down that term, pensionable pay, because you're going to hear a lot about it in the next five to ten years in the state of California as all municipalities, as our state government, confront this pension tsunami. Because as Judge Goldsmith has pointed out, and is unassailable, pension benefits are vested. You have a right, if you stay for 30 years, to whatever multiplier that you received at your highest pay your highest pay. Now who sets your pay? Is that vested? The courts have been unequivocal. No, your pay is not vested. So when you take a look at the vested right and say, okay, there are things we can't change, but there are things that we can do to influence that formula. If you accept the validity of the formula and stop fighting about retroactively taking it away and sauntering into courtroom and overturning MP1 or MP2, we got in a hole, accept the formula. How do you influence the formula? That's what a business person would do. And by the way, vested rights may not be able to be taken away to a class because the vested right is a contracted right between the employer and the individual. But like any contract, if both sides agree to amend the contract, it can be modified. I know you're asking, well, why in their right mind would an employee in the city government want to go from the Cadillac pension tier down to the Chevy? I'm glad you asked, because all of these things, when implemented together, actually play on each other. 
we need to reduce and freeze pensionable pay. The city of San Diego, for every year that it freezes base salaries, the actuary that we hired and the pension system will confirm, you will receive savings. And I actually had our actuary simulate a 20% reduction in the city's workforce through managed competition. And I want you to simulate this opt-out program. Suppose that we con people into, or somehow get them into, opting out of high tiers into low tiers. Give me a 10%, 20%, 50% participation rate. He laid it out. And while there are savings, and we should take advantage of those savings, the unfunded liability is for past service. That is that weight around our neck that keeps pulling us down. The only thing that dramatically impacts retroactive past service is pensionable pay rates because that is projected to go up 4% annually under our actuarial models and our pension payment to the system. It's what drives our net liability. For every year that the city of San Diego does not increase salaries, pensionable salaries, let me correct myself, pensionable salaries by 4%, you receive actuarial gains. The liability goes down and your debt service goes down as well. By freezing our salaries for five years, pensionable salaries for five years, the pension payment that we're paying today in FY16 will be lower. And in fact, from the projected payment in FY16 today, it will be $80 million lower, or a 20% reduction. Now, people might say, well, I'm still not happy about the fact that we're paying more than $200 million for defined benefit. And then, of course, when you add in all the other retirement costs, it's actually $370 million in this year's budget for a total fringe benefit rate for retirement costs alone of 68.7%. Private sector, national average, 16% for the most uh, uh, generous benefits. For nonprofits, it's 13%. Fringe benefit for retirement. Uh, Mr. Zuquette says, well, our salaries are 53,000, our pensions are 31,000. He includes the pre MP1, MP2 retirees in his sample. He does not include drop, which is now annuitized over 20 years and adds on to people's pensions. He does not include the SPSB 401k system, which up until recently for his union, city taxpayers were matching up to 6% of city employees' salaries and a mandatory match of 3%. It all adds up. They're pretty generous. The Mercer Company has pegged his bargaining unit's sal uh, pension uh, excluding drop at 129% of their highest salary if they uh, retire at age 67. Um, the salary is also the base salary that he mentions, 53000 does not include something called add-ons and special pay. Let me tell you a little bit about special pay. We have over 250 special pays in the city's budget. In fact, they are so complicated and so many that we just implemented an ERP system, Enterprise Resource Planning System, a real powerful computer. We spent $18 million on it this year. It is so complicated with our special pays that the ERP system can't figure it out. It has brought our financial management division and our payroll division down to its knees. Many of those special pays, the vast majority of them, are pensionable. So your base salary that's in your formula gets added on to with special pays, which increases your pension formula and your pension benefits and ultimately increases our debt and our annual cost. So we have to commit to freezing the base salaries, changing the pensionable status of all special pays. My office received an, a, a, a legal opinion today from our legal outside legal counsel confirming that the pensionable status of special pays is reformable. You can, sub, you can subject it to meet and confer and reform the pensionable status. You can change the pensionable status and still let them have that money. And taxpayers will still be far ahead because of the pension savings. And under my plan, we also are willing to give our city employees a share in savings. Because having a salary freeze for five years on base pay, some might say, well, golly, that's tough. You know, it's, it's a hard-nosed strategy. I would also mention to them that, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, private sector compensation in San Diego County has been reduced by 13.47% since the beginning of the recession. Just put things in perspective. But we're willing to freeze pensionable pay 
and I would be even willing to give in the last two years share in savings, which under our modeling amounts to a 5% salary increase in those last two years for all labor unions. However, I will require that it not be pensionable. In the water department, which Mr. Zuket represents, there's a bid to goal program. They give out bonuses based on incentives. I have a lot of problems with how those are given out, but those bonuses are not pensionable. So what we need to do in order to get around these liabilities is we need to be willing to embrace new thinking. A new way of compensating our employees. Um, I had an auto dealer in an earlier briefing today. We briefed business leaders on this. He runs many of the auto shops, uh, auto uh, uh, stores. And I said, you know a little bit about commission. You offer a small base, but you offer a very generous commission. I'm not suggesting that we offer city employees commissions, but what I am suggesting is that we, we move from a base salary plus add-ons approach to a net compensation model, and that our financial managers and our elected officials must be far more sensitive and in tune to the pensionable pay decisions that they make today, because that will drive up the annual pension cost into the future. Rifle shot real quick. Uh, the uh, opt-out program is incredibly important to reform pensions long term. Um, in order to do that, we need to increase contribution rates, which is important. Uh, we are doing that by eliminating offsets, which is discretionary. We have complete control to do that. City attorney is making exceptionally good progress on his substantially equal lawsuit, which will infuse an element of risk. If city employees know that they're on the hook for investment losses, they may feel uncomfortable in that higher tier and want to opt out. Um, I do not believe that it is clear that we can retroactively apply substantially equal on investment losses. It may be. But the tool is still very powerful on a go-forward basis when you present the city employees with an option to opt out and you say, look, you will achieve immediate take-home pay improvement because the normal cost is much lower in these plans. By the way, you're going to pay for that higher tier because we're getting rid of your offset. And did I mention if we have a big reduction in our investments next year, you will be subsidizing that loss as well? I don't know about you, but I'd rather get into a 401k and control this myself. Or at least be in a lower tier and perhaps as part of that lower tier, the city would commit to bear the risk. These are all issues that are subject to negotiation. However, they do not violate vested law, vested rights, and they are completely in the control of the city as an employer. These are the items that we have to grapple with as a, as a, as a community. I'd like us to emphasize these liabilities and these reforms rather than play the back and forth black and white game of either raise taxes or cut services. Because the answer to city, the city of San Diego's problems are neither. It's truly reorganizing and restructuring, or as Judge Goldsmith says, implementing a workout plan to these liabilities. Thank you. All right, I'm going to um, ask uh, Mr. Uh, Zuket to respond to that in a moment because so much uh, fantastic information that we received from the councilman I think was directed at a, uh, what Mr. Zuket does. But let me ask, by way of clarification, uh, Councilman, freezing pay, now would that include the police department and firemen as well? It would, um, and we're talking about freezing pensionable pay. So if we have money left over in balancing our budget that somehow you know the economy spi spikes forward, I have no problem in sitting down and discussing those additional revenues as long as the compensation is not pensionable. Because until we can reform our annual cost of pensions, we have to aggressively manage the amount of pensionable pay that we put into the compensation packages awarded to city employees. Your discussion is extremely sophisticated and uh, it's hard for me at times to follow the ups and downs of the numbers and everything you were going through. So how do you propose that Mr. Zuket go to the rank and file and simply explain in plain English why they should accept a, a freeze of their pay for the next five years, given, I know there's some controversy about, it, is their pay good, is it bad, is it indifferent as far as other pays are concerned? Assuming that is somewhere in the neighborhood of what Mr. Zuket says, what does he say, in simple terms, why they should buy into that program? 
Well, first, under California labor law, um, if his union does not buy into it, five votes of the city council imposes the terms, plain and simple. We would like their participation in how we craft the details, but the city of San Diego can always impose uh, changes in compensation. Second, I would suggest that the, the, the labor unions work to take this idea and um, make it their own and try to, um, assuming that we might have five votes on the council to do this unilaterally, how would you like to see it happen? How would you like to see this, the share and savings program? How do you uh, build in accountability so that if we do achieve cost savings that at least the city employees can gain share in those? Um, don't take our word for it, because you you've seen with MP1 and MP2, you cannot trust a mayor and a council. I will tell you that right now. So get it in writing, and maybe even put it to a public vote so the voters know, hey, we agreed to this up front. We were the ones that voted for this. Um, but simply saying no, 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 look, that's what we've done for the past 10 years. We need a fresh approach. We need to get a can-do attitude for this. And I will end on, on one element, which is, Mr. Zuckett can also sit down with the labor union and say, the big thing driving this is the unfunded liability for past service. Maybe we afford ourselves section 143.1 of the charter. And we have a discussion on how that can be used to perhaps reform benefits as a collective class. I'm not sold on that reform. I know the SD SIRS attorney has opined about it. Other attorneys have opined about it as our pension system is unique in the state of California because we have a vested formula, comma, subject to collective bargaining change or collective vote change until I get a consent decree uh, or a writ of mandate from a court saying, yeah, it's all good. I'm not going to put it as our hope in the plan or our guarantee in the plan, but it's something that, again, if the labor unions truly wanted to understand what we need to hit, uh, then they can come up with ideas to help us get there. Uh, Mr. Zuchett and I had a conversation once and he hit the nail on the head. I'm okay talking about reform as long as you tell me what is the darn target I need to hit. And don't come back to me next year and say, oh, well, there's another target I want you to hit. I want to know what is the magic number. And as part of this financial plan, we're laying the numbers out. If we hit those numbers, great. Any surplus, let's sit down and talk about it. But I think labor negotiations ought to have that maturity of, here's the number. Here's our plan for achieving it. If you have a better plan, by all means, shove it on the table. But it's got to hit the number. There has to be guarantees of hitting the number. Mr. Goldsmith has yeah. asked for a point of privilege. I'm just going to defer to him for a moment. It's not a point of privilege. Uh, what I want to do is, uh, is um, express, is describe that a little bit more. First of all, um, Councilman DeMaio pointed out that with five votes, we could, um, the city council could impose that. What he's talking about is, um, under state labor laws, um, to change terms and conditions of employment, the, the city and the employer and the employees must engage in good faith negotiations. We take that obligation seriously. But should you get to an impasse, uh, every every government, local government, has a different process. If you just can't reach an agreement, uh, you've tried. San Diego does have the benefit of having a, an impasse process which says that the city council is empowered to resolve the impasse. So in the final analysis, it is the city council that makes the decision and could impose that, um, but only after you negotiate in good faith and you're not to breach existing contracts. Let me uh, take another step. He talked about the uh, what is it that uh, Mike and the others would, would talk with their members about. Um, I've always talked about a global settlement, and I've explained what that means. It, it sounds bigger than it is. You and I have talked about that when we're in front of with lawyers and uh, civil cases. It means you resolve everything at once. Uh, this city never ends the debates, whether it be the ticket guarantee or it's still debating whether that was good or not. What we need to do is a real workout plan. I don't know whether it's this, this one, or some others. And then make it stick. We need to, you know, our city charter puts together this, this uh, uh, establishes what our, our um, pension plan, the parameters of our pension plan. It has a very significant provision that's now subject to litigation. It says that the cost of, our, of the, um, uh, the pension plan, normal retirement benefits, are to be split substantially equal between the employer and the employee. And we've, we've got a lawsuit to, to, um, to enforce that. Uh, 
I'm not going to discuss the lawsuit all that much other than to say that there are these provisions and other provisions can be amended as part of this, can be changed by way of a global settlement. As Elaine Reagan, who is from um, ST Surge, knows, there's a lot of holes in, in the charter provisions and even the ordinances having to do with the pension and other provisions that they've been grappling with over the years. We can clean it up, we can put it into the charter, we can make it clear. Um, as an overall global settlement, we're talking about ending the, the decade of lawsuits. Let's have a, a settlement that resolves this, helps the city put together a workout plan, clarifies our charter language on our pension plan, makes it work, updates it so that it means, means something, clarify it, and, um, and put in there a finality to this. Uh, so whether it's this plan, I don't know whether it's this one or something else, but that's, uh, that's where I, ag I really agree with what the councilman just said. Let's, let's have a final number and we can make it work legally. All right, uh, Mr. Zuket, uh, Councilman DeMaio is obviously loath to raise taxes uh, as a source of revenue uh, or to cut services. And he says freezing salaries is, uh, is, is a way we have to go, or at least we have to put it on the table and talk about it. Is he on the right track? Well, first, let me just agree with him that I'm feeling sleepy too, and uh, just a little, just a little humor there. No, and I've been sleeping like a baby, so it must be some other reason. But look, you don't have to guess what employees would do to do pay freezes for the next five years because we've done it already. City employees have not had a pay raise for five years, and in fact, we've taken a six percent cut in our compensation a couple of years ago. So, city employees are participating. We're, we're being laid off. The city of San Diego is down thousands of employees, about 3,000 employees from its peak in 2006, which is a percentage difference of about 25%. Um, but let me just agree with Mr. DeMaio on another very big point, and let's have some fun. Restructuring our liabilities. I agree. So let me ask some personal questions and bear with me. Raise your hand if you own a home. And raise your hand if you have a mortgage on that home. And le leave your hand up, please. And raise your, leave your hand up if it's a 30-year mortgage. And now envision yourself uh, hitting the economic skids and losing your job and, and needing help financially. Re leave your hand up if the first thing you do is call your mortgage broker and say, get me out of this 30-year mortgage. I want a 15-year mortgage. I want to double my payment. That's exactly what the city of San Diego did and the retirement board did. The pendulum, which admittedly was way over here back in the glory days, CalPERS, in fact they may still have this system, they had a 40 year rolling amortization, the complete BS. They never paid a penny of interest. Rolling means it's a 40 year debt and it basically refis every year so it never goes down. So that madness was replaced with, let's, let's take our biggest debt, our only true very long-term debt, not our only, but our biggest long-term debt. And even though we bond out our stadiums and public works projects and pipes and everything on 30-year schedules, we want to increase our payment to the system. So let's reduce the amortization schedule of the system. That's what we did. So when Mr. DeMaio talks about high labor costs, he, he, he carefully says that. He's not saying that compensation has increased or benefits have increased. The costs have increased because of things like this. The system now has a 20-year amortization, but it's really more like a 17-year amortization because they pay sort of above and beyond for the first couple of years. That's what we've done with our biggest debt. They also restructured and got very conservative on a lot of other assumptions, and maybe they were right to do so. But those other collective assumption changes, and they're the stuff of actuaries, and I don't want to make everybody sleepy, but it's, it's fascinating stuff, but it has a huge impact on that unfunded liability. And the changes they've made to reduce the assumption rate, for instance, of the return on their investment from 8% to 7 and 3 quarters, even though their historical average is about 9% return, as well as other funding changes, has increased automatically overnight, not overnight, but over the course of a year or two, the unfunded liability by about $400 million. I don't know the exact number on what it took the unfunded liability to reduce the amortization, but think if you called your mortgage broker today and refied at your same price into a 15-year mortgage, your payment would go up a lot. And so I totally agree about restructuring our liabilities, but we've done just the opposite. We restructured them to pay more. That's one of the reasons the city attorney, when he talks about this big drop-off that's coming soon, and I think it's a lot sooner than 2040, I think it's more like 2025, it's 15 years away, there's going to be a big drop-off. 
that'll be a good thing. In the meantime, it's going to be very painful. We could restructure our liabilities today, just into the average bond terms that we do our other long-term liabilities, and we'd have a very different financial scenario. But God forbid anybody suggest that now because you want to pay less into our pension system? You must be wacko. Well, um, not to point fingers, but that's the fault of people probably on my side of the aisle who played too fast and loose with those assumptions before. And now the pendulum has swung and we're all going to feel it. Um, and this notion of, I must say, um, uh, this total compens net, excuse me, net compensation model, as he calls it, as Mr. DeMaio calls it. Um, if, again, this is, this is not a disputable fact unless, unless I hear differently, but the city's own compensation studies, taking total compensation, not picking and choosing, and not allowing Mr. DeMaio to pick and choose, but total compensation, put it all in, and then do the same thing for other employees across the state of California and other large cities. And the city of San Diego is on the low end of those compensation models, particularly when it comes to police and fire. And so this notion, so you, you may argue that all public uh, salaries are too high. Uh, fair enough, we can debate that. But in terms of how we're doing with our, with our, compar with our counterparts in other cities, it's, it's San Diego is on the very low end. And it goes to Judge Goldsmith's point, which is that at some point that comes back to bite you. At some point you become the training ground, you run your police academy, you spend a bunch of money training a police officer, and then he or she leaves to go to Riverside or Temecula or Los Angeles or any other place because they pay a lot more. At some point, that compensation matters. It may not matter for every classification in the city, but it matters for a lot of them. And so something's got to give. Um, I just want to throw one other thing out there, this notion of never-ending debates. And I'm not suggesting anything of Mr. DeMaio or anybody else involved with this, but you do get the feeling that there's forces in this town that like the never-ending debates. I, I think the solutions are out there, but you got to admit, 60%, 66% in the primary, it's good politics. It's good politics. And so I think that's the force that, frankly, is the hardest to, to combat in this city. And whether Prop D was good or bad, and, and I wrote this this morning, I think you have to respect the coalition that was brought together, business and labor. I think it's a good start to put us all together, even though the, it's probably better for all of us to dig in our heels and say, screw you, and for the other side to say, no, screw you. But we've been doing that for a long time and we continue to go down the rat hole so let's try and work together i think the approach that the city attorney articulates although we certainly have our disagreements is very constructive is very constructive and we continue to try and work with him and anybody else who wants to the, to come to the table and i think the mayor is also doing that and the majority of the city council to realistically work these things out and we're going to continue to do that so that's a long way to answer your question of what do the next five years hold i don't think there's a city employee who thinks that they're getting a raise next year or the year after that or the year after that or the year after that can so we put that in writing and we can just seal the deal right now i, I just said there's not a city employee who thinks that they're going to get one so right. this so this notion that city employees are sitting here uh, like pigs at the trough, you know, waiting for more money, that's not past practice. And I don't think you'll dispute that that's not true, Mr. DeMaio. And so I don't know why the mayor's five-year plan or Mr. DeMaio's five-year plan, both of which are going to hold that no pay raises happen in the city, um, should be a shock to anyone. So um, the city employees are there. They're at the table. Uh, do you have any fears that if a pay raise, if a pay freeze went into effect, that uh, just given the marketplace right now and other jobs available in other, in other areas of California or outside California that there would be a significant loss of employees or given the economic times would they just you think basically suck it up and do what they have to do? Well uh, appreciate the question but we don't have to guess. Uh, it happened in the city of San Diego with police officers just two years ago in the midst of all of the uh, benefit takeaways particularly for new hires which, as Jan Goldsmith said, is one of the prongs of pension reform. That's been done in the city of San Diego. A new employee in the city of San Diego is on a very different uh, 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 set of pension benefits uh, than an existing employee. Whether it comes to retiree health, none. Drop, none. 
13th check, any of those other ancillary pension benefits? None. SPSB? Gone. Uh, a new pension system with much lower multipliers is in effect. So that's been done for new employees. And the effect, along with the pay cuts and pay freezes, was police officers, there was literally an exodus going on. And the city council responded with an 11% pay raise that year. This is just two years ago. This wasn't, you know, back in the, back in the good old days. And so it's happened. Uh, would it happen today? Um, probably not. Could it happen literally tomorrow or next year? A absolutely. It's a, it's a fluid marketplace and it's a competitive marketplace, especially on the public safety side. Right. And before I open it up, uh, and I know it's already 710, I thank you very much. I think we've just, this is marvelous just to listen to these people talk. Uh, I'd like to have this go on for hours, but I want to ask the councilman. Uh, I'm, uh, number one, fairly pessimistic about the future over the next five years. I'm a, uh you know, resident of the city of San Diego, and I don't understand much of the rhetoric that's gone on at this table. All I know is that uh, we're not having our taxes raised, so there's no revenue source there, and uh, geez, I want uh, my police responding to my house and the firemen responding to my house uh, uh, if that you know, it comes to pass. If you find down the road that your projections are not as optimistic as you hope, and you've gone, come to the point where you cannot reconcile bankruptcy with, I've got to either raise taxes or cut the, the public service sector, police and fire. Which way do you go? If you came on the horns of that dilemma. I, I, I'm, I, I've gone through the budget with a fine tooth comb. You guys will be appalled by the things that you're going to read about tomorrow. 700 hours of personal leave. Every year people can and go through a policy of cash in lieu, where they can cash out their leave or portions of their leave. Five million dollars in that alone. The fire department, if you get assigned to a desk job, you get a 15% pay increase, which by the way is pensionable. That's a specialty pay. I mean, you go through these, these I mean, we reimburse people mileage at a higher rate than the federal mileage rate. I mean, I could go on and on and on. It is outstanding, the level of, of waste that's in this budget. Uh, Mr. Zuchett says, oh, you know, compared to other cities, we're, we're really at the low end. Have you seen the Wall Street Journal's report? It was just a couple weeks ago, showing how public sector salaries and benefits are, and salaries, base salaries, they were looking at base salaries, much higher than the private sector. There is a fundamental disconnect between public sector budgeting, financial practices, and compensation models versus the rest of the world. And it's only been heightened by the economic recession that we've seen in the past two years. This is the time for an adjustment. And San Diego voters were very clear that they want reality and adjustment in city government. They do not support the tax increases and frankly there's no need to. There is no need to. Uh, another example, let's look at our service delivery model. Um, you dial 911, they show up with a fire truck and an ambulance. The mayor during one of the debates said, I dialed 911 at this funeral when this lady passed out. And we were so worried with it. every moment that passed, we just couldn't understand why isn't the truck here yet. And I turned to him and I said, what, was she on fire? <laughs> I mean, we have other cities out there that go to an ambulance-centric model. And so under my plan, I put $3 million tomorrow in the fire department to deploy ambulances to browned out fire stations. 85% of our 911 calls are for emergency medical responses. 15% are fire or other related. Let's get real with our service delivery model. I mean, they want to put trucks, four man crew trucks, based on overtime. So my original proposal to restore fire uh, houses was we'll take away your EMT specialty pay because you have to be an EM EM EMT in the city of San Diego to actually be a firefighter. That's like saying wanted, lawyer, great benefits package, great salary, and if you have a law degree we'll give you a bonus. It's your basic requirement. That would save five million dollars, 5.4 million to be precise. I said, well, what we'll do is we'll put the 5.4 million, take it out of the budget, and we'll give you that in overtime for you guys to man fire rigs, and let's get some of those stations open. No. I mean, there has to be some adult supervision, there has to be some reality. So if we are paying less than San Jose, I can't do anything about that, 
but I want to make sure that benchmark to the lo local labor market that we are competitive with our pay scales and our benefits. And right now we are over over the mark when it comes to competitive benchmarks. Before a few comments, uh, I just want to ask the audience, does anybody have any questions? I know I've got, go ahead, yes, right over here. Uh, your, Honor, your comments assume that everyone's going to sit down at the table and deal in good faith. And, and, and that's a big assumption. And Mr. DeMaio, my question to you is, uh, and it's specifically brought up by Mr. Zuken, the council has the authority to end the debate. Your Honor, if you want to get it, we all know, give someone a deadline and then those settlement negotiations seem to accelerate and to get closer to that deadline. It triggered me, maybe if the council stepped in, gave a deadline, and that would sort of bring everybody... They don't want a deadline. They, the council's part of this. And I'll be very blunt. The one thing we've run out of is money. We're quickly running out of time. They want to drag this out. Because the longer you drag it out, the more people that enter the pension system. And once you're retired, there's nothing you can do. At least with the current employees, we do have levers, as Judge Goldsmith has noted, levers to make the reforms happen. So it's a time game. Well, well I've now heard Mr. Zuckett refer to they, and now I've heard you refer to they. So it sounds like they on both sides of the equation, and someone ought to step in and force they to sit down and settle this. Is there, I mean, one of the things that uh, Mr. Goldsmith, uh, former Judge Goldsmith and I can agree on is that once you give lawyers a deadline, it gets done. Uh, the worst thing you can do with a trial date is to continue it uh, because then the case just drags on. If you set a trial date and you stay with it, typically the case resolves and never goes to trial. But so let me just ask, is there some mechanism in place as of tomorrow that somebody somewhere could say, okay, this will be resolved as of October 15, 2011. And if not on that date, then on October 12th, this will happen. Let me, let me uh, respond to that. As I said, the marbles are in the, the city council's bag because they have the power to uh, resolve an impasse. But we are subject to state labor laws. And state labor laws require both sides to negotiate in good faith until they reach an impasse. And then you go through that process where we hold all the marbles. State labor laws do not allow us just to arbitrarily set a deadline because we have to negotiate in good faith. That doesn't mean that we have to get a agreement. There are times when we don't reach agreement. Uh, but if we, put, we can put things on the table, we can negotiate in good faith, and we can try our very hardest to, to get things done on a, in a quick manner. But to put an arbitrary deadline would be, a, uh, just an arbitrary deadline would be a violation of state labor laws. So we don't, we don't want to go there. But I think the frustration is when it goes on for years and years, like managed competition went on much too long. And I'm not throwing darts at anybody because we had an outside lawyer, the city had an outside lawyer who really caused that problem in, in many ways. Um, so we just need to be smart about our negotiation and uh, be aggressive in getting our positions on the table. Yeah, I'm just going to go, I'm sorry, I'm no. just going to go from right to left, so you're right, go ahead. If the city and its employees cannot directly negotiate and resolve the problems, and there aren't five votes on the council for Mr. DeMaio's plan or some other plan, the, the options are to build a business uh, civic coalition that will collect signatures and place us on the ballot. Uh, Judge Goldsmith is correct. You cannot set an arbitrary di deadline. But if a group goes out there, files a ballot measure, and starts collecting signatures, when I did my camp competition ballot measure, oh, the labor unions were falling all over themselves to come to an agreement. Absolutely. They were banging down the door. Oh, no, absolutely. The mayor's plan, the county plan, let's do it. So I think if you move forward with a, a citizen's ballot measure, uh, that also uh, removes a lot of the need for meet and confer on issues because if there's no discretion given to the employer and the charter has changed or an initiative mandates something and there's no discretion, it's not a subject to meet and confer, guys. It's done. Let me just let me just let me just throw in one more thing on that. Well, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I just kind of get another question or two because we're in way over. Yeah, Go ahead. I, that we've got to negotiate in good faith. And the second you put that word in the law, what is good faith by definition? You're going to have a lawsuit. And the second you get into an intricate lawsuit dealing with paper, the $500 an hour lawyers are 
are going to step in and you've got years of litigation. Because what is good faith? I'm watching the body language of Mr. Zakat and the councilman. There's totally different as to what may be defined as good faith. I mean, I've watched the Greek asides with those two. Yes, yeah, you're a great guy and the rest of it. What's going on in the mind is not that. You're hearing, you dumb whatever. When we get into it, start throwing phrases like that, it would be so worked by a group of attorneys. Yeah. Bob, it's state labor law. That's the problem. Oh, I understand. Yeah. But, I, no, there's uh, legitimately good faith. Uh, you want to reach the agreement. You really don't want to force things on your employees, but there's, they're going to be, as I said, tough medicine as whether it's administered one way or the other. I agree with that. But can yeah. you get Mike or Gary to say anything was done in good faith? If he had a, an agenda, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Let me just it only takes one of those. And we've watched a lot of that litigation in this city over the last 20 years. But whatever you're seeing in my body language aside, I, I promise you I have a great deal of respect for, for Councilmember DeMaio. I, 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 I really do. And I, and I, it doesn't mean you don't, but it and, doesn't mean that yeah. you don't politically I, I, reply here when you're not doing so necessarily. Well, no, I, I actually, I never cuss. I've never, I, I don't even know what the F word means. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 no, but but let me just throw one, one other thing, and it goes to the last question also. This notion as if we can just negotiate all the way. I, I'm not sure. I know. Well, maybe you didn't hear me, but I hope you heard the city attorney and even Councilmember DeMaio. You can't just make the stuff go away, especially the past liability. Let's take retiree health. If tomorrow Councilmember DeMaio's plan is to eliminate, say it's will we'll, lawsuits come what may, we're going to eliminate retiree health for existing employees. You still have a seven or eight hundred million dollar unfunded liability that even Mr. DeMaio nor Mr. Goldsmith, not even Mr. Aguirre, says you can lawfully take away from employees who have already retired. So it's good faith or no good faith. It don't matter. It's it's a debt. You got it. We got to own it. We got to do something about it. Employ take take current employees aside. All right. Yes. Well, that was kind of my question for Carl. If your plan were implemented tomorrow and you went through the five years. Did I understand you that we're going to save 80 million as against 250 or 500 million a year? The uh, pension payments are still shockingly high, mm -hmm. but they are sustainable. Um, the plan achieves 80 million in savings next year for FY12. We have to ba budget, uh, balance the budget. Over five years, when you add in the retiree health care costs that are eliminated, the pension costs that are reduced, and the streamlining uh, reforms. There are about $750 million in pension and retiree health care costs that we are able to avoid, and an additional $316 million in savings from reorganization and reform. Um, and that really shows you how much the pension and retiree health care liabilities are truly the drivers of the cost. Um, and that includes the unfunded liability that we're not paying on retiree health care. So I booked that as a cost avoidance. Even though you're not paying it, it's still a cost. So if you eliminate the benefit for current employees but keep it for retirees, and that's what the plan does, I believe that we need to continue it for retirees. Um, Partly because we can, under the financial plan I put together, you don't have to eliminate it. And also, I don't think legally we would survive the lawsuit. I've read the city attorney's uh, opinion on this matter, and it, he lays out, you know, this is these are risks. So I'd rather create a plan around legal authorities we know we have. And then if the unions want to come along and say, well, we don't like that. Okay, well, on these things that we think there's a little less legal authority, Will you stipulate to the, the settlement? This is a modular plan. There are things in here I know they're not going to like, but that's because you're not giving me an ironclad route to the things that I know you'll like more, but you may not have uh, the ability, we may not have the ability to implement because you would not be part of the settlement. Well, really, then my question is, what I was getting at is, is your plan, even if it's implemented, enough? Yes. It, it, it is enough. It, we still are going to have to pay a, a pretty significant annual pension payment. But if you've seen on TV the bar graph that keeps going up, when you see the bar graph tomorrow, it flatlines and slowly starts to reduce. 
Uh, now, if we go back to increasing pensionable pay, it will increase, but not to the level it is projected today. And that's so important because there's no way, as Judge Goldsmith noted, in FY 2025, $500 million pension payment. There ain't no way we're going to make it. So we have to change that part of our balance sheet down to sustainable levels, and I believe that we do bring them to sustainable levels. And just one other thing, on your assumptions in your plan, what does it assume the economy is doing? Or is there any bearing on that? The economy under the actuarial models is seven and three quarters, which is the official rate that we assume. We've also taken and we've assumed a 5.35, uh, five and three eighths return on investment, as well as a higher nine and three eighths investment, or three quarters investment. Uh, we did that because we wanted to see what would happen if we implemented sub-equal, whether we would lose. And actually, um, we, we make out in both scenarios, both five and three quarters and nine and three quarters. The only time we actually lose is if the pension system generates above 11.5 annual returns for, for 15 years, and that ain't happening. So even on the low end, the plan balances, uh, particularly if you get uh, progress and, and, and assurance of Jan Goldsmith's substantially equal legislation, or uh, litigation. Judge, I have a suggestion for you. Why don't we take about a 10 minute break? I know some of the panelists may have to leave, some of the audience may have to leave. Uh, we can have some of the pizza, and then if you guys can stick around for some Q&A, we can continue the Q&A in about 10 minutes. All right. For those of you who are leaving, and I want to just thank everybody for being here. Uh, fascinating topic. Fascinating topic. And I just want to thank our panelists for providing their insight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now that DeMaio's gone, let's really tell it like it is. Come on, yeah. Zuket. <laughs> Let's see what questions we have. Right, what I really wanted to tell Carl was, no. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, well, so let me just start out. Are there any other questions? Yes, in the back. There are two court decisions that happened by this time many years ago. Gwynn and Corbett that I've heard for years had frozen those benefits that were available at that time as available to any city employee that wants to retire that was then hired you know, in the city workforce at the time. So I'm not sure how, since they were fairly you know, generous uh, conditions, um, how you can get around any of us who uh, were hired from before then, so simply opting and taking a corporate option, for instance, instead of sitting with whatever it is that comes out of, uh, of Mr. Jeremiah's proposals. Do you know what benefits were in play in those one or both of those cases? Um, you know, if it was pre 90%, so you could continue to accumulate uh, higher percentages of your salary. And, and uh, your and your question is, uh, it seems to you that something is happening different than what should have been the outcome from those two cases? No, no. What I'm saying is that if if they're going to be playing with the uh, benefit structure and everything, how do they get around oh. where we have the court decisions in place that say henceforth anyone who was a current full-time full-benefited employee at the time that this decision came down will henceforth have the option to take this decision. Well, let me, let me see if I can respond to that. First of all, um, I made it really clear that about benefits, that vested benefits, um, and I am protective of that because that's my obligation to enforce the law. Now, there are still legal challenges that were made, still subject to court and, and all that, but um, 
I don't believe that what I heard from Councilman DeMaio was to change um, any of those court decisions, um, change any vested benefits. Um, I didn't hear, I'm not familiar with the whole, the, the whole um, proposal. I only know what I heard. Uh, what he was focusing on was uh, salaries in the future. And um, the city does have the ability subject to meet and confer and, and MOUs and um, obviously good faith uh, uh, negotiations to uh, to determine the salary structure uh, for the city. So I think that's what he's doing. We can't violate contracts. We can't violate court decisions. We can't take away appropriate the, the proper vested benefits. We can't affect contributions. Um, the extent to that is subject to some legal cases. Um, so I, I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, the other one that I wanted to get to was since the average age of the city employee is 49 right now, um, is there any reason why the city couldn't have a position that would well, as I pointed out, some, you know, the, the tough medicine part of this is that when, when employees leave, they take with them their pension rights, whatever they have, they get, uh, but they don't have a future pension. Um, unless they've been vested and there's, you know, they get what they, what they got. That's a way of cutting future benefits. Now, the other side of that is what I also pointed out. I don't want to lose good people in my office. Um, and so I, I want to be, I want to make sure I understand, I'd like to make sure I understand the market. I'll tell you right now, I, I am familiar with the market for lawyers and what they're being paid, quite familiar. Um, and, and I'll tell you that generally, generally, the lawyers in our office are underpaid from what they would get in the private sector. I don't know beyond, uh, beyond that. I don't know for our classified employees because I, I don't know the market for that. So I, you know, one of the things I'd want to do as a proper manager is do a market study, do a real competition. Let's see what people are paid. Hope that answers your question too. There, go ahead. Jen. On the bankruptcy issue, could you walk us through that a little bit? Well, I, I understand what you just said about we can't do this and we can't do this and we can't do this. But we can do well, I also went through what we can do, yeah. Okay, but I'm just saying, in the bankruptcy alternative, the uh, court of equity, right? I mean, didn't in the Reagan years, didn't all the corporations go down to okay. bankruptcy to get everything adjusted? Let me give a few minutes on the on the bankruptcy. Yeah, I, here, I'd like to right, because it is always brought up. I mean, even Judge Orfield brought it up. gave him gave Demile the the choice: Would you cut the services or go to bankruptcy? I, everybody brings it up, and it, part of it is this guy Aguirre. Uh, they believe him. Oh, give me a break. But it's not just in San Diego. It's across the country. I, uh, it's an easy way. Just go bankrupt. Everything goes away. It's magic potion. Let me tell you. Let's not talk about magic. Tell me why. Well, let me, Orange County came out. Let me explain. Okay. Number one, cost. Orange County filed bankruptcy and it cost them about $100 million. That was 20 years ago. And when they came out of bankruptcy, their pension was not touched. Um, I don't know where we, our uh, bankruptcy for San Diego would cost somewhere upwards of 100 million. Who knows what? It would be a great stimulus package for lawyers and accountants. Um, but we'd have to probably have a surcharge somewhere on a tax to pay for it. Um, number two, even being qualified, um, I doubt the city is qualifies. You have to be insolvent. We're not. Number three, if the real problem in the city of San Diego is the pension, which I think it is financially, that is, a, that is the huge problem, pension and retiree health. Never in the history of this country, ever, ever, has a government changed public pension benefits through bankruptcy, ever. Now, United Airlines, everybody uses that as an example. They went through Chapter 11, and they got rid of their pensions for their um, for their pilots. And everybody wants to do the same thing to our our people. Well, that was Chapter 11. That's for corporations. This is Chapter 9. Chapter 9 was adopted during the Great Depression to allow cities to file for bankruptcy. And the first version of Chapter 9 
was found unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court because it violated uh, local control uh, as required by the U.S. Constitution Article, anybody ever know? I don't remember off the top of my head. And, uh, Tenth Amendment, the United States Constitution, uh, states' rights. Congress went back and they revised it and they gave an approval process for states and it passed muster and it's been in existence since the 1930s, never affecting pensions. There are people like to cite the case of the city of Vallejo in which a bankruptcy judge allowed the city to abrogate existing contracts, executory contracts. We have a labor agreement, an MOU with MEA. If we filed bankruptcy using the city of Vallejo, uh, we could probably abrogate our existing MOU. I wouldn't want to do it. It's good for both sides. But that's what they did. They had a lousy current MOU. They didn't touch pensions. The bankruptcy judge didn't say a word about pensions. Pensions are protected under the California Constitution as a right, a property right, similar to your home. Taking away a pension, vested pension benefits would be similar to take away your home. They didn't go there. The city of Pritchard, Alabama file a bankruptcy for the second time and all the advocates were looking at them because Pritchard, Alabama stopped paying pension benefits in Alabama and they had retirees who weren't being paid they filed bankruptcy and they were the great uh, chain, uh, you know, law that's creating this law um, and there was worth watching for a while except that uh, the bankruptcy judge dismissed the case and threw him out of court. Uh, in order to, in my opinion, take away pension benefits, you have to overcome, number one, our city charter is our local constitution and says they are protected. And you can't change them without approval of the members and the retirement system. That means the people you're taking away have to say, yeah. The bankruptcy court would have to say, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, make it. We're, we're going to ignore that. We're going to ignore the California Constitution and all the Supreme Court decisions. And we're going to say, federal preemption allows us, as a bankruptcy judge, to preempt the California Constitution, Supreme Court decisions, and the local city charter. And therefore, you're going to get wiped out. Never happened. Now, that would have to go through bankruptcy court, a judge to find that the appellate court, and then to the U.S. Supreme Court. That would take years and years, if not a decade. During that period of time, what would happen to our city? We'd be paying hundreds of millions of dollars in legal fees and accounting fees while we take that case to the U.S. Supreme Court, and we'd probably have to pay our pension uh, payments along the way. Huge amount of acrimony. How many of the, the street in front of your house would the pothole be filled? Yeah, they'd go to pay for the legal, the legal costs. It would be uncertainty and acrimony for nearly a decade. And in the end, I would predict that the U.S. Supreme Court, and Frank, for that matter, virtually every bankruptcy court and appellate court would say, no, we don't go that far. Why? For two reasons. Number one, I believe it would violate the spirit and intent of Chapter 9, the revised provision. If you're going to respect state rights, you're going to respect the constitution of the state, and you're going to respect the local city charter. Number two, the courts would be opening up the floodgates. There are thousands, if you haven't noticed, San Diego is not alone. There are thousands of cities and counties across this country that have similar pension problems. We would have thousands of bankruptcies that would affect our economy, and you'd be taking away pension benefits from retirees. What are you going to do with the people who are in, the re in retirement homes? What are you going to do? They, they contributed to these pensions for years. You would have to have an entirely new court system. And who the heck knows how many, whether you'd have to pay for the lawyers to unwind all of these retirement benefits. It would be a mess. And judges, as Judge Orifer knows, and I know, do not like to open can of worms. If a can of worms has to be opened, we don't do it by legislating from the bench something that hasn't happened for th 60 years. We say if Congress wanted to provide to over overrule California Constitution and city charters and take away vested pension benefits, they would have put it in the law itself. And uh, it's not for me to legislate from the bench. What's more, I personally will be against such a decision of uh, I would be for state rights. Why? Be careful when you look to Big Brother to help you out when you got a problem. 
If a bankruptcy judge has, under federal preemption, the power to ignore the California Constitution for vested pension benefits, then that judge sure as heck has the power to ignore the requirements of voter approval for tax increases. So if that same bankruptcy judge could say, you know something, I'm not going to eliminate the pension benefits. I'm going to go to, and I'm going to order your city to increase your taxes. But wait a second. We have a, we have a process in our constitution that says we can't increase our taxes without voter approval. So do you think it's viable or not? I mean, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody here think it's viable? <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> So I could go on. <laughs> it's not a lot of people, and a lot of people, including Aguirre, says, "Well, just raise it so you have leverage with Mike and, and these folks." I'm not going to insult their intelligence. We got plenty of leverage. We can break an impasse with a majority vote of our council. Can I, can I just add one thing on that? I'm certainly not going to mess with the with the legal analysis, but in there is a finding of insolvency. Right. You have to be insolvent. This city is so far from insolvent; it's not even funny. We have today, if the economy. You have, to, you have to make one assumption. You, you don't assume any roses, but you just assume that it doesn't get worse from here, the economy-wise and revenue in the city. No new taxes. We have about a 60 to $80 million structural budget deficit. That's what we need to solve. We could solve that tomorrow simply restructuring the pension debt to a 30-year amortization. I'm not suggesting, as, as Jan said earlier, and I think he's correct, there's no magic bullets, but just, just as a for instance, or other types of fixes. This city has never missed a payment. This city uh, has a very high bond rating relative to other municipalities. We have high reserves. Even in our hellaciously uh, cut budget last year, we still made payments to our reserves. There's nothing that remotely smacks of insolvency of the city. And so it's used by Mr. DeMaio and Mr. Aguirre and others, as Jan just said, as, as this stick. Whether they really believe it's a good thing, I don't know. Um, they're, neither one of them are lawyers. Well, let me defend DeMaio. He has never said, he has never advocated bankruptcy, Mike. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. I'm glad somebody's going to defend him. Um, <laughs> I said I respected him. Um, uh, so anyway, so you, you got to forget about the legal stuff. There's no insolvency in the city of San Diego. Question over here. I'd like to address, oh, sorry, I'd like to address a question that Mike's had. I'm old enough to have had some So the city and the unions are about to sit down and negotiate retiree health care. And what the unions have to navigate is our legal position. Our legal position is that just like the core features of a vested pension benefit, because of the way the city has acted over the last 30 years with respect to retiree health, that retiree health is also a vested pension benefit under the California Constitution as the city attorney has articulated. So in that context, even if we thought it was a good idea, if I thought it was a good strategic decision to do that, we couldn't legally do that on behalf of our members who have individually vested rights to that benefit. So the union, MEA anyway, will be looking at these negotiations as to how we can make concessions and compromises, and that's what we're going to do, as we have done in the past, within that legal context. And the, the situation you bring up w would violate for us that legal premise that we need to keep a hold of because if we don't and we negotiate it away, at some point we lose our legal argument, which we feel very strongly about, that retiree health is just as vested as the core pension benefit for other employees. So we will be at the table. We won't be uh, offering up uh, to, to significantly diminish the benefit because we don't have the legal right to do that. Well, why can't we give up anything? Well, let me, let me, uh, let me negotiations start next month, and, and you'll you'll be the f one of the first to know. Let me respond also to to Mike for one thing. Um, we of course have a difference of opinion. We think that retiree health is 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 not vested for current employees. But setting that aside, if they're correct that it's um, that is vested, it's only because it's part of the retirement system. And under Section 143 of our charter, the retirement system is must be contributory. It must be based on contributory plan. The city employees have never contributed to the retiree health, and that may be a way of some common ground because 
uh, that is not that is surely not a vested benefit to have no contributions so um, maybe there is something that can be done along those lines what do you think of that uh, <laughs> he's thinking I'll, I'll get him off the hook I, I can I, just see this I as part he, of the headlines later on though I, I think he asked me the question well I'm and, asking and, you and, and you answered him and I think you answered it well <laughs> correctly <laughs> okay I, I think that's a good idea yeah all right thank you it's it uh, one, one more question one go ahead yeah, no, it's good. My, my question is we should the, the only agreement that everyone had to the figures that you threw out earlier is that someone seriously stopped in it when they agreed to all these things however many years ago and no one agrees who did it but i, I was wondering if you give me an impression was it because they were dumb <laughs> or lazy the people acting on behalf of the on the, the taxpayers you know, or the City. I, in agreeing to this, they have a wolf, wolf over their eyes? Yeah. Did they have a personal incentive to agree to this ridiculous structure? Yeah. Or were they falling in line with the federal representatives of, of the citizenry and just mortgaging the future of uh, their, their kids? Uh, 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 the last one. I, I don't think any of the other ones are true. I think, I know this will come as a great shock to you, I think politicians are short-sighted and so they made year-to-year -year decisions and they were incentivized to do so. The newspaper, the business community, the labor community rewarded politicians with popularity and re-election if they solved the problems of the day. Well, and, uh, and, that, and, that, and that meant a ballpark here, potholes here, a new fire station here, pension, we'll leave that to the next people. So I think it was um, within the short-sighted general uh, tag, some of those people knew that was happening and then you could assign perhaps some of the other labels you said and some of the people didn't even understand that that's what they were doing and I think, you, I think that was both. Well, there, you know, there's an additional part of this since this is a legal group. Uh, in the, the mid 1990s, the California Supreme Court found it was it held it was illegal for any government to um, uh, to inadequately fund a public pension. What they did in '96 and 2002 was to increase benefits and decrease contributions. Obviously, was inadequately funding. They did it in public, as I read. They they intentionally did it. They intentionally violate. They they and they violate the law. There were lawyers there. The, the lawyer for the, the pension board said, you're just kicking this, the can down the road. Future taxpayers are going to be burdened. The city attorney's office was, not, was there, didn't say a word in both cases. And they, and they deserve some responsibility for that. Uh, how do we protect against it happening? Uh, there were some amendments to the charter that says that you cannot increase benefits without a vote of the people. That was approved in what, 2006, was it? I think it was a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, that, is, that is a good protection. But another part of it is we, we need to enforce the law. And I think the other answer to that, and Jan I think said it well earlier as, as Judge Orfield and Jan were gently chastising me for pointing fingers, Jan stepped up and said, hey, everybody look in the mirror. And I think that's absolutely true, that the public was either all of those things you said, either not paying it, and the media and everybody else, either not paying attention, knew it was happening and let it happen because it was in their interest to let it happen, and so I think we all have a little bit of responsibility for paying closer attention to the government and what it's doing to us or for us, depending on where you sit. How could you take the stock market for granted? How could you assume that that would continue on forever and as rosy as it was when these things were being passed? How could you make decisions where you knew you didn't have the funds to support it? Well, we hope we do in 10 years. Everything will be just as great, probably even greater than it is now. How could you say that in all fairness to the people that you were you know, elected to, to represent? and make a decision like that. I mean, that's just kind of astounding to the general public. Stupid. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to use the word stupid, but uh, I, I think it was the culture at the time. I, as I understood it from all my reading, it was just the culture. That's just the way things were done. How short-sighted can you be? That's just the way things were done. It's not the way to run a government. But Judge Orfield, and I hate to pick on him. Sure. Well, I, I don't hate to pick on him, but, <laughs> but, but I hate to pick on him when he's not here. This guy, and you just heard him, he came down to the city council in 2002 and he gave Mayor Murphy the uh, Performance Institute gold standard of fiscal responsibility. Now, think of the tech, going to your point about the stock market, think of the tech boom and the, our, 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 even though our pension fund, although nobody really knew it, was already headed downhill significantly in terms of its funding level, at that point, at least on the books, it was 103% funded. 
it was overfunded because of the stock market boom. And everybody thought, well, this is the way it's going to keep going. Stock markets keep going up, right? Or at least, you know, it's certainly not going to crash, you know, 60% from here. And even people as, as sanctimonious and bright as Carl DeMaio were up there, you know, right along with it. And so I don't think you'd call him, I know you weren't calling anybody stupid, but I, I don't think I could call him stupid. I think he you know, was doing his thing back then just like he's doing his thing now. And the reality, if we can all cut the crap and get somewhere closer to the approach that some of us would like to take is that we're not that far off. Let's figure it out and move the F on. But I don't we're, know. I don't we're know going to have to end on sanctimonious and bright. So thank you very much. <laughs>